Hello, everyone. I just want to say thank you for coming. No snow today. However, I can't say the same for tomorrow. So <laughs> it is winter and the sun's out. I mean, doesn't it feel good? I think it's wonderful. Um, one brief thing. Some of you have said you're not getting our emails. Um, so none of them are bouncing back. So look in your junk mail or spam. And, and if, if they're, they're in, in there, there, what, what we want to suggest you do to try to establish a connection with our MailChimp, which is what's sending out messages now, our emails now, you'll, you'll see, see in the brochure, in the, brochure, in the in website, website, send them to this address. I'm not expecting you to write it down, but it's info at eevermont.org. A lot of you have sent emails to that in the past. Do it again. And hopefully, hopefully that will work. work. And if it doesn't, my phone number is in there. Just call me and we'll, I'm a, there's another possibility. So anyway, so I want to introduce Calvin today. I think a lot of you know who he is. Yes, you know, I remember uh, him being in his car during the pandemic. Remember all the reports? And he'd be like this. <laughs> so he's not like that today. We're thrilled. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Calvin Cutler, Cutler is an Emmy-nominated reporter focusing on government and politics for WCAX in Montpelier. He came to Vermont in September of 2019, diving into the legislative debates surrounding paid family leave and minimum wage. He also has covered the Scott administration's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the state's ongoing health care reform efforts, and the conversation around emerging forever chemicals known as PFAS. Growing up, his passion surrounding public policy and government reporting was sparked by the work of the Washington Post surrounding the Watergate scandal. We all remember that. Calvin has worked in television news since 2017 when he graduated from the New England School of Communications at Hudson University in Bangor, Maine. In 2017, he began covering City Hall, tribal affairs, and breaking news at KNBN in Rapid City, South Dakota. That's cold there. Yeah. He also worked at WVII in Bangor and at Falmouth Publishing on Cape Cod Mass. Calvin lives in Burlington as an avid hiker, skier, and vinyl enthusiast. So please welcome him. He's going to tell us all about what's going on down there in Montpelier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me okay down, down here, right here? Awesome. Yeah, I couldn't have uh, put it better myself. Thank, myself. Thank you very much, much for, for having me and, and taking the time to listen to a little bit about what's happening in Montpelier. Um, I'll tell you, this is a really dynamic legislative session. There is a lot going on. There's a lot of pent up energy in Montpelier um, with lawmakers, a lot of big pressing issues facing the state, especially coming out of the pandemic. Uh, so I just was hoping to sort of set the stage of, of where we are politically, sort of the balance of power, where some of these decisions are being made within the state house what some, what some of the, of the big, big priorities, priorities are, are and, and what some what of the some bigger of the bigger pieces of legislation are as well. As we know, there's big pushes for, for you know, paid, paid family medical, medical leave, leave and childcare, child housing, housing um, um, climate, climate uh, investments, uh, investments and weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels. fuels. So there so certainly, certainly is a lot, lot that lawmakers are going to be uh, tackling, tackling, or they already, they already are tackling, are, I should say. say. Um, um, next, next week is the town meeting day break. break. So, so a lot of you as well will probably, probably be voting, voting on, on, if you haven't already, already school, school budgets, budgets and town, town items, items and whatnot. And whatnot. So, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking we, can we can just sort of dive right into it. So I just think it's important to set up where we are, and this probably is not news to anybody, but the Probably, Probably the, the biggest, biggest factor, factor leading, leading into, into this legislative session and the political makeup of Montpelier, Montpelier right now was the retirement of Senator, Senator Patrick, Patrick Leahy. Um, um, because, because Vermont, Vermont is a small, small state, state, we have a small, small congressional, congressional delegation, delegation, two senators, two senators one representative, representative. Um, um, and, and Senator, Senator Leahy, Leahy Senator, Senator Sanders, Sanders and, and Congressman Welch at the time had been in, in office, office for so, so long. long. There's, There's been, been a real, real backlog, backlog of political, of political talent. talent. People, People haven't, haven't been, been able, able to work their, their way up through, up through the congressional, congressional level. level. And so, and so when, when Senator, Senator Patrick, Patrick Leahy, Leahy retired, retired, that essentially, that essentially uh, started, a, started a, a massive, massive domino, domino effect, effect 
of people of being, being able, able to seek office. office. Um, um, of, course, of course, as we know, know Senate President, President Pro Tem Becca, Becca Ballant ran, ran and, and um, was, uh, was victorious, uh, victorious in, in her congressional race, race and so now so serves uh, Vermont, Vermont in, uh, in, uh, in Congress. Congress. Uh, uh, and then in, in her wake in the Senate, we've had other lawmakers step up in terms of statewide offices. We have uh, at uh, least four, four or five, five new statewide office, office holders. holders. Um, um, and, and in the legislature, in the legislature too, there's, there's been, been a, a huge, huge shakeup shake in the political dynamic. Uh, over a third of the entire legislature uh, retired last year or moved on to other offices or was stepping back from, from public service. So there is a massive, uh, a seismic under, uh, a seismic change happening in Montpelier right now. Certainly it's a really big generational shift. So I think that said, that, that's sort of what leads into where we are with this, this sea change. And I'm sorry if these might be too small. I uh, didn't quite know the makeup of the room, but these slides will also be online, I guess I'm told as well, potentially, yes. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, uh, and as everybody here probably knows, in Vermont's House of Representatives, we have 150 members. Uh, in the Senate, we have 30. Um, in the House, there were about 50 new members, uh, including about eight new committee chairs um, of, of jurisdiction. So that is a, a really big shift in terms of who is calling the shots in some of these committees, uh, you know, what bills, what policies they decide to take up. Because ultimately, the bills are, are debated on and voted on the floor uh, of the House or Senate, but it's really in committee is where all of the action happens. That's where all of the deliberations and all of the testimony and all of the work really happens in committee. And it's the committee chair who decides who to bring in to testify, which bills to, to take up, which ones won't make it onto the floor. So I, I can't really stress how, um, how, how important that, that turnover has been in terms of the public policy direction in Montpelier and what issues lawmakers are deciding to take up right now. Um, and I think just, you know, one reason as to why we've seen so much turnover, I think there's three big things that I'm really hearing. Number one uh, is burnout among lawmakers from the pandemic. We can get a little bit into it later, but lawmakers have been um, remote the past, uh, I guess, since March of 2020. There's been very few in-person interactions at the State House. It was shut down. They conducted the whole session remotely. In fact, Vermont was one of just a, a handful of states that made the switch to try to keep um, staff at the State House and visitors and the press and uh, lawmakers and lobbyists safe from COVID. So it's been, everything's been done online. Um, and then there's also, oops, sorry. Um, and then there's also, uh, you know, this emerging discussion, which isn't new, but it really has come to a head during the pandemic about support for lawmakers and what it means to be a citizen legislature. Um, many of the lawmakers, as, as you know, we are a citizen legislature. And so, uh, and it's a part-time legislature. The, it goes from May, or excuse me, from January until May. And a lot of these people work everyday jobs in the off season. So lawmakers work very long hours. Unlike other states, they don't have support staff. And uh, there's a very low pay and low reimbursements for meals and travel and rent if they live in Brattleboro and they need to rent an apartment in Montpelier or Barrie. So some of those financial supports for, for lawmakers are, are very low. And that's one thing that we've heard of, of, why, um, of, of why lawmakers have been stepping back. And then the other part, um, you know, anecdotally, I've heard some step back too because there's a feeling of, of increased partisanship. Um, you know, there's this saying that all politics is local we're seeing this trend now where all politics is, is national, where there's a lot of things that are happening in Congress and DC and on the national stage, which are sort of seeping into local politics uh, on the state level and maybe even into the local municipal level, if, if you've seen that in some of your communities as well. So I think that was one of the, the other, the third reason I think that there was some, some turnover in uh, the legislature. But that said though, having, you know, a, a lot of new lawmakers brings new energy, new ideas, uh, fresh perspectives. 
Um, as I said, it's, it's been a really big shakeup at the State House in terms of what policies they decide to, to, to tackle and, and the energy in the building as well. Um, and then I think the other big part of this too, which also can't be understated, is the reapportionment process, right? So every 10 years, as you know, the census goes through and they uh, you know, reevaluate the um, you know, voting districts for the House and Senate to make it more proportional, to make sure that everybody's vote uh, and every senator and representative, by and large, has this equal amount of power. But as we know, we've seen a, a shift, a population shift from um, the southern and, and from the Northeast Kingdom. More people are moving toward Chittenden and Franklin counties, and people are leaving the Northeast Kingdom and more rural parts of the state. So that's also led to a, a, a shift in power as well um, at the state house. So those are some of the, the underlying um, currents, I guess, that are leading to this massive shift in in uh, demographics at the, the state house, so to speak. Good. There we go. And then I guess we already talked about this a little bit, and I've spoken with some of you today of just how um, you know you can tune into the legislature. So some states are already doing this, not everybody, but now that lawmakers are back in the building full time, um, one of the, I think one of the best things to come out of the pandemic, as challenging as it was, is we have this new remote format where everybody's there in person, but they have big TVs and on the middle uh, or in the middle of the tables, they have these cameras with a fisheye lens that can see 360 all around. So this is the House Human Services Committee. Um, I think this was like last week or two weeks ago. I don't know what they're debating, but you can see everybody that's in the room. It picks up their audio. It, you can see who's in the room, who's testifying. And one of the best parts is if uh, you are, a, uh, let's just say, um, a service provider down in southern Vermont or you're somebody from out of state and lawmakers want to hear what you have to say about a specific bill or a policy, you can hop on Zoom and you can testify right in front of the legislature and everybody can watch you on YouTube. So it's really been incredible to see um, you know, the, uh, the, the access and the transparency and at times the accountability as well to see that happen in real time. That's a, a technology that, that Vermonters have, have never really been able to, to interact with in real time. Um, but I think that's that's one of the biggest changes uh, that's you know shifted at the state house too is lawmakers know they're being watched, but also um, more people can participate in the pro in the uh, process. So it's really uh, it's it's really incredible to uh, to see that. And of course, you can. It's not just all committee meetings, but all House and Senate meetings, and those are stored uh, in perpetuity on YouTube as well. So um, it's it's really exciting stuff. So just briefly, as I mentioned, talking about the balance of power and where we are politically in the House and Senate, um, there's been a big turnover. And in November, um, the Democratic Party at the State House did uh, very well in a lot of elections. Uh, Democrats in the House with, with 150 members, they now hold 104 seats. Uh, Republicans hold the fewest than they've ever held at any point. Uh, since reapportionment back in 1964. Um, and they hold 38 seats, uh, progressives hold five, and independents hold three seats. Now this 104 number is key though because um, to override a veto from any governor, you need two thirds of a chamber to vote to override. What well, that 104 number is key. Democrats no longer have to lean on independents or their progressive allies to try to override a, a, a veto from Governor Scott or whoever, whichever governor, I guess, comes, comes next if they hold those numbers. But, you know, and, and a lot of Democrats have said this is, this is a good thing. We're, we're really excited about this. But I think it's also worth pointing out that just because there is 104 Democrats doesn't necessarily mean everybody is always going to fall in line, lockstep, vote on the, on the same party or in uh, as as one voting block, so to speak. Depending on the issue, there are some more moderate Democrats or or you know others that might have a, a fiscal um, a philosophy more more so aligning with Governor Scott or others uh, in the legislature. So just because it's 104 Democrats 
doesn't necessarily mean it's a slam dunk uh, to, to override vetoes. Um, and I think it's also worth pointing out, though, that in both the House and the Senate, uh, leaders have told me that it's overriding a veto is never their first uh, instinct. You know, that, that's always the last uh, line of, of we need to get this policy over the finish line. Um, they always try to work with the governor, with the administration, with Republicans to try to pass those policies in a collaborative way and to try to iron out those, uh, those, those differences. But that said, though, um, 104 uh, is, is a really significant number in, in the House of Representatives. Um, I wish I had a, a similar spread uh, graphic for, for the Senate. Unfortunately, I don't. But um, it's kind of the same story in the Senate as well. Uh, which is, as I mentioned, is made up of uh, 30 uh, senators from all 14 counties, 22 Democrats, seven Republicans, and uh, one progressive. One progressives, I say. But <laughs> whoops. A anyway, but um, it's kind of the same same dynamic, right? Uh, you know, uh, Democrats have that that two thirds needed, but uh, again, depending on what the vote is, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it will be veto proof. Uh, just looking yesterday at the Affordable Heat Act, which I'm, we'll get into in, in just a little bit, um, but that was a pretty close vote. Um, where there are some Democrats that that voted against that as well. Um, so again, just because you have the numbers doesn't always mean that everybody's going to fall in line. Everybody has a different philosophy of governance and and you know represents their different constituents' ideas in in many different ways. Um, so. And then I guess the, the, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Governor Scott, too. So you have the Democrats uh, who received uh, a, a many, many seats in November. Uh, but Governor Scott won by his largest victory, by his largest margin yet. He won every single town in Vermont, and he secured 71.3% of the vote. And even recent polling has shown that Governor Scott continues to be one of, if not the most popular governor in the country as well. Um, and so I think that talks a little, that shows a little bit about how Vermonters like balanced government, right? Uh, you know, Democrats in the legislature, but to have, you know, a moderate governor, fiscal responsibility, um, you know, protect the most vulnerable. Uh, I think those are those are some of the governor's key, key, um, components and some of his core values. So you have this interesting dichotomy of Democrats in the legislature, but a Republican governor. Um, but again, you know, Democrats could override vetoes if they want. But as I mentioned, it's, uh, it, it, that's always the last resort uh, to, uh, to have a veto or a veto override. The governor likes to try to reach out across the aisle and work with, um, you know, the legislature as well. So. Oh, he says so. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a, we can ask that question, too. It's a, it's a good one, though. And then I think it's, it's worth noting, too, um, you know, in terms of leadership in the House and Senate, uh, Representative Jill Krowinski of, of Burlington, she's serving her second term as House Speaker and um, Senate President Pro Tem Bill Baruth. Uh, he's been in the Senate for about 10 years now, 8 to 10 years. Um, he took over for... Uh, Becca Ballant, who, as we know, is in Congress. So each one of them, though, brings their own leadership style, their own priorities uh, to the table. Certainly, Representative uh, Krowinski is really um, uh, made child care and paid family leave two of her biggest priorities this session, um, as is Senator Phil Baruth, but also he's wanted to focus a little more on uh, gun policy as well and trying to um, you know, restrict guns in the hands of, of younger people and try to reduce gun violence and suicides in the state. So each one, each leader in the House and Senate has their, their own priorities. And so that's interesting to see the leadership uh, between the two and the, the relationship and how, um, how that squares with each other. So, and then I guess before we dive into some of the specific bills that, you know, lawmakers have been working on, the state budget, as we know, funds everything that that lawmakers, uh, you know, it. the budget is a reflection of the priorities of the legislature and of the administration. As we know, the governor crafts a budget um, and lawmakers use that as a, a starting point and they craft their own budget. 
then at the end of the legislative session, he can sign it into law, let it go into law without a signature or veto it. Um, but this year, though, coming out of the pandemic, we are in a, a really wonky economic moment, um, I guess, to, to say the least. You know, so because of Senator Patrick Leahy and the small state minimum, which he helped us, uh, you know, achieve, Vermont really made out well in terms of appropriations to, uh, to Vermont between extended unemployment, uh, direct stimulus checks, PPP loans, business grants, the CARES Act, the American Rescue Plan, through all of these different uh, pandemic relief programs, the state of Vermont has roughly about 10 billion, with a B, $10 billion that's coursing through our economy. Some has been spent, uh, some money is still in the pipeline waiting to come down. And there's also uh, federal infrastructure money as well. So there's a, a lot of federal money that's coming down the pike. Um, and that's playing out in many different ways throughout, throughout Vermont's economy. Um, and it, that in part, you know, there's a lot, there's been a lot of debate. There's been a lot of, um, you know, yeah, debate of, of what is driving inflation and federal spending is part of it. it. That's one element to this conversation surrounding inflation. But as we know, to try to, uh, you know, tamp down inflation, which is, having a real impact on um, services throughout the, the state, uh, whether it be people going out buying groceries, having work done on your car, rent, uh, the cost of, of living is not just in Vermont, but, but nationally is, is rising. So to try to tamp that down, uh, the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates to try to cool down the economy. So the way that the um, legislative economists and I was the one that took this this graphic from them. I have to, uh, to to attribute this to Tom Cavett in the legislature. But what the Fed is trying to do is is raise interest rates um, to cool down the economy. So we've got one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake, essentially, where we still have all of this COVID money that's flowing through. Towns have American Rescue Plan money for infrastructure, for uh, you name it. Um, but We've also got, and, and that's fueling the economy, but you've also got interest rates which are rising to try to cool it down. So we're in, a, as I said, a very wonky time right now in the economy, and that's leading to a lot of uncertainty in the state budget. So, but we're, we're forecasting though for that money to essentially go away in, in a couple of years, um, and the economy is going to cool off. We still don't know exactly what that downturn will look like. Um, you know, the, the Federal Reserve, keeps talking about wanting a, a soft landing, but we, we'll see what, what that looks like. But there will be some type of landing. And uh, so because of that, the legislature this year is, is really looking to make key investments in things that will um, help Vermont through any type of, of economic downturn and beyond. So things like childcare, infrastructure, broadband, um, workforce development, they say that these these investments are going to be key, really, to try to, um, you know, strengthen our, our economy, strengthen our demographics and our workforce for this downturn, this downturn but also whatever comes next. Um, but again, the, the biggest question, though, that we get with any state budget, uh, you know, year over year is how do you balance or, or to what degree should you put money into programs that's one-time spending versus ongoing appropriations? Um, for example, there's a... a uh, universal school meals, uh, lawmakers are looking to um, try to find funding for that, about uh, 15, to anywhere from 12 to $15 million, I think is the price tag, of an ongoing appropriation. Um, so that's one of those, those uh, line items that lawmakers are, are trying to dig into, where can we find this money year over year, but then also, you know, have those one-time investments too. So I uh, just briefly wanted to get in a couple pieces of legislation. I don't know what we're doing on, how am I doing on time? Oh, perfect, okay, great. Awesome, wonderful. <clears throat> um, so as I mentioned, and I'm sorry if there's too much text here, I haven't made a PowerPoint in a, a very long time, um, but I'm more of a video guy than a graphic designer. But um, so, you know, two of the things that, law, that especially Democratic lawmakers in the House have been working on are uh, paid family leave, 
and universal child care. Both of these uh, policies are still in the works. Uh, they're working through committees. So this is how it stands as of right now. None of these are, are final per se. But for paid family leave, you know, they're hoping that this is a, a real critical piece of, of social infrastructure that you know, employers can use to um, uh, incentivize people to come work for them and bring people to the state of Vermont. Uh, ideally, lawmakers would like to see up to 12 weeks of paid time off to care for a sick loved one or a newborn um, or recover from a personal injury. Um, and that would be for every worker across the board. Um, they'd like to see full wage replacement up to a living wage. And uh, that would be funded by about a half a percent payroll tax. Um, but again, we sort of run into this philosophical debate of, of what is the best way to serve Vermonters and how do we fund some of these programs. Uh, the governor, um, Scott, is, is opposed to new taxes. He says that Vermonters are already overburdened with taxes. So he is moving forward with a voluntary plan um, for employers while lawmakers are, are going with a mandatory plan. Um, so this has been one of the bigger uh, political discussions of, of this legislative session. More on this to come after town meeting day. And the other thing with uh, universal child care, um, this has been, uh, you know, a lot of the state's challenges uh, are really interlinked. Uh, housing, child care, workforce, our demographics, all of these interplay together to, to, um, to how do I say it? All of these issues are very interconnected, and they play out in a very real way in communities across the state. Lawmakers are hoping to make big investments in child care because we need to bring in more people to our state, and employers need people, but also we want people to have families and to be able to support those families so they can be part of our workforce. But the problem is, as uh, we may may know, there's finding childcare slots is very challenging. It's it's really hard for young families to find childcare slots, and um, the uh, wages for childcare workers are very low. Uh, so there's a workforce challenge, but there's also it's a supply and demand essentially that isn't isn't being met. So lawmakers are are hoping to um, you know chip away at the problem. Uh, the there was a report that was put out saying that childcare would cost um, well over $100 million uh, annually to try to set up a universal system. So lawmakers right now are trying to you know, bring four-year-olds into the public school system, therein create opening up those slots for other families, for kids. Um, and it, it would also extend subsidies to, to uh, more families. Uh, again, this there's this is a still a fast moving conversation, but it's it's another really key uh, policy that lawmakers are working on that they see as a a really critical piece of social infrastructure to support and uplift families. Um, so there's that. Everybody's favorite, the Affordable Heat Act. Um, this one is uh, it's very complex, and there's a lot of lawmakers that are, are still trying. To, to wrap their heads around it, but essentially in 2020, and I'll try to uh, boil it down as best I can, but in 2020, Vermont passed the Global Warming Solutions Act, which um, mandates that the state reduce its carbon emission levels by certain levels by certain dates. Um, we have a, one coming up uh, in 2025, we have one coming up in 2030, and another one in 2050. Um, to reduce our carbon emissions, you know, we have to enact policies that will help people transition away from fossil fuels. One of the uh, the climate action plan, which is this this uh, or the climate action council, I should or the climate council, put together recommendations, and one of them was for a clean heat standard, um, essentially a, a performance based standard which would help wean Vermonters off of fossil fuels. Uh, and reduce our thermal emissions from businesses and from homes, uh, which currently make up about 30% of Vermont's emissions comes from our homes and from um, home heating, oil, and propane, and kerosene, et cetera. So for a lack of better words, and I'm, I'll try to sum it up as, as briefly as I can, the clean heat standard 
creates a marketplace of credits that fuel dealers can earn by installing eco-friendly uh, forms of home heating. Think cold climate heat pumps, wood pellets, um, uh, you know, efficient bur um, uh, water boilers, things that will help reduce our carbon emissions. And the idea is to wean Vermonters off of fossil fuels. But the, the challenge really with this policy has been for a lot of lawmakers is what is the upfront cost to Vermonters? How will this affect people in the pocketbook? And what will it do to um, individuals' home heating bills? And as of right now, we don't have that immediate answer. We know that the state that in the long run it will save the state uh, six billion dollars um, by by 20, 2050. Um, so the weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels is going to save money in the long run. But uh, we just don't know right now what the Im immediate impact will be on uh, Vermonters and their home heating bills. So that um, has played out. It's been one of the bigger issues uh, of this legislative session. Yesterday, there was a, a really big vote in the Senate where they voted uh, 19 to 10 to advance the Affordable Heat Act. But this time, though, they're, they're taking a, a bit of a pause. They're going to spend the next two years studying and, um, you know, trying to assess the impact. You know, how much would a clean heat credit cost? How do fuel dealers obtain them? What should this new marketplace look like? And ultimately, what will be the impact on Vermonters? Um, you know, Governor Scott has uh, said that his biggest opposition is he worries about rural and low-income Vermonters. Um, but at the same time, as I, we mentioned, there's still a lot of subsidies coming from the federal government. There's a lot of help to make this transition. So supporters argue that if we were to make a transition to um, electric heating and, and uh, transforming our, our grid, now would be the time. So again, it's, it's uh, still a, a very much a work in progress in the legislature. Um, it's definitely one of those bills that's incredibly complex, just like Act 64, I think it was, was the school merger um, law. There's, uh, it, it's a very, it's a complex one to, to, um, for, for policymakers to, to wrap their head around. So, um, but that said though, uh, it, it's moving forward and we'll see how this plays out in the House of Representatives, which it will move over there after town meeting day. Um, as I mentioned, another one of the big uh, policy priorities especially on the Senate side, has been uh, gun reform. As we know, there was a, a couple of laws signed into law last year, but the biggest sweeping gun reform happened back in 2018, um, where the governor worked with the legislature to pass uh, a red flag law and, and several others. But this year, lawmakers are looking to continue that work, especially uh, you know looking at it through more of a public health lens, um, certainly with suicide prevention, but also looking at some of the uptick in gun violence that we've seen uh, in, in some communities across the state, because um, it is a, a, a statewide phenomenon. Lots of communities have, have dealt with it. So, you know, things like uh, waiting periods where you'd have to, um, you know, uh, you buy your gun, but you'd have to wait anywhere from 48 to 72 hours to physically receive it. That's been shown to potentially uh, you know, cut down on, on, you know, suicides and give people that time to, to cool down, so to speak. Um, safe storage requirements so young people can't, uh, you know, get their hands on, on firearms or, uh, you know, so they don't get stolen out of cars. That's been a, a challenge in Burlington. Um, an expansion of, of red flag laws, um, straw purchases, uh, essentially buying a firearm in one person's name and then having another person use it. Um, and then removing of serial numbers as, as well. So um, these are all pieces of, of uh, legislation that lawmakers have been looking at in terms of uh, firearms. But one of the biggest challenges this year uh, you know, to this, or one of the biggest questions I should, should say, is the Bruin decision. It was uh, from the Supreme Court, I believe last summer. It was issued on the same day as uh, when Roe versus Wade was overturned. Um, and two really big Supreme Court decisions, um, without getting too far into the weeds, but the, the Bruin decision really has thrown a lot of current and proposed gun reforms 
for a loop and has put them in doubt. Um, and so I think that's something that lawmakers have really had to contend with this session of what can we do, what can we put our energy behind, but also what won't get challenged in a lawsuit going forward. Um, so that's, that's still an ongoing conversation, especially in uh, the Senate. Um, but it's, uh, it's definitely, it's, it's a fascinating one, one to see. Um, everybody's favorite, healthcare. Um, there is a lot happening in the healthcare arena right now. Uh, it's a very complex intersection between mental health, um, long-term care, skilled nursing, um, our, our healthcare workforce. There's a lot of challenges facing our healthcare system coming out of the pandemic, but there's also a lot of opportunities as well. I mean, certainly the, the biggest thing that, you know, the legislature is trying to tackle right now with our healthcare um, system is stabilizing the cost of healthcare and to bring it down. Right now, there's, like in every, just about every sector of the workforce, there's big um, shortages in our healthcare sector, in nursing, in long-term care, mental health, you name it. And because of that, they have to bring in traveling nurses or uh, temporary staff, which they pay more. And so that is driving up the cost of health care, plus general inflation, as I mentioned, is um, services and, and, and uh, medical materials, um, physical space. I mean, a lot of things are, are you know, the, the cost is, is um, being driven up. Um, and also, there's an underlying challenge of, you know, right-sizing Vermont's health care system. There's a long simmering conversation as well at the State House, um, which is actually going to be playing out in a few weeks uh, this summer, um, about what should Vermont's healthcare system look like? Should the state be funding, I believe it's 12, 13 hospitals, I think? Um, should we have full service hospitals in every county of the state um, and be offering every type of service? Or, you know, should most of the services be offered at, at UVM or in the Chittenden County area and have, you know, more uh, clinics and, and be able to refer people? Um, and again, I mean, that's a longer simmering conversation about what should our health care uh, system look like and what should the footprint of it be. But that's, what, that's another really big conversation um, that, that lawmakers and the Green Mountain Care Board as well, uh, health care regulators will be tackling this session and probably next session too. Um, and then of course, you know, challenges that are also um, out of our hands too. Uh, some things like, you know, the Medicare or Medicaid reimbursement rates, uh, there's a federal match. So um, that funds a lot of really critical services for, for um, Vermonters, everything from housing to healthcare to uh, food assistance in some ways. So Medicare reimbursement rates have uh, really uh, posed a challenge to Vermonters, and there is definitely stress on the Medicare budget, um, but or Medicaid budget, excuse me. But uh, lawmakers are, are looking to make strategic investments, and again, that's another uh, a long, long simmering conversation with no easy answer, so to speak. But uh, but that said, you know there are a lot of bright spots to our healthcare system right now. You know, Vermonters, by and large, uh, we are one of the healthiest states in the nation. We have one of the, the oldest workforces and oldest demographics in the state or in the nation, but we also have one of the healthiest and one of the most active. So that really helps, uh, you know, bring down the cost of, of health care. Um, and also, as, you know, Vermont, as we've talked about, our, we have declining demographics. People are, are growing older. You know, there's a, a bigger conversation happening of what should the state's plan for aging and supporting, um, you know, older Vermonters, what should that look like to make sure that everybody um, ages well, is engaged, is uh, plugged into their communities, has, you know, mental health uh, needs addressed, has nutrition, housing, to make sure people, um, you know, live with dignity. So the state is working on a comprehensive plan uh, which is the result of about six or seven years, I believe, of, of work. Uh, the Vermont Department of Health Access um, is, is working on a really comprehensive plan to show what, what does that pathway look like. And then, of course, there's also our healthcare reform efforts as well. Um, I won't get too into the weeds with that. I, get, I, I love talking about health systems, but um, we're, we're basically switching over how we pay for healthcare from single or from 
um, a, a multi-payer system to a all-payer system where uh, we were flipping how uh, healthcare is paid for on its head, uh, pooling Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance, and instead paying doctors flat monthly rates as opposed to having them charge for each individual procedure. So when you think about it, uh, doctors are paid to keep people healthy as opposed to keep people sick, or not keep people, but treating people treating people that, that are, are sick. So there's a lot happening in our healthcare arena right now, um, but I think some of the bigger ones definitely right now in the immediate are about workforce, um, staffing, and mental health needs as well. Um, so there's, there's certainly a lot to, to work with there. And then I guess uh, one of the last ones too is um, housing. This has been a really big, um, a, a, a really challenging policy arena for lawmakers to wrap their heads around. And there's a lot of philosophical debates about what should the future of Vermont look like? What should our communities look like? Um, who should have access to, to land, to resources? Those have played out in many different ways this session. So one of the biggest policies that lawmakers are working on is this housing bill, which essentially would um, help build more dense development in our downtowns and urban centers. Uh, we want more people to move to the state. We want more um, housing, but of course we don't want urban sprawl. That's something that, you know, it, the, the state, it's, it's uh, we, they're at a little bit of a crossroads in terms of what should Vermont look like. And so there's a, a number of bills at the state house and one of them essentially looks to look t take zoning, flip it on its head, and um, incentivize more downtown development, and modernize Act 250. As you know, that's the state's uh, landmark land use law. Um, and part of that, they're tr looking to get rid of some of the Act 250 exemptions so there isn't a duplication of, of uh, efforts. So if I'm a local, if I'm a zoning or a, a developer, I want to build an apartment building, I have to go through a local development review board and a Act 250 district commission, they're looking to get rid of that, that duplicate step, which uh, some might say is driving development away. But on the other hand, um, there's, there's definitely some are, are cautious uh, about overdeveloping and bringing too many people into Vermont's downtowns and, you know, um, tarnishing the way that you know, rural Vermont in many of these towns look um, and feel too, because that's why in many regards we, we love Vermont because you can go to somewhere like Hardwick or go to Newport or, or fill in the blank. Uh, each of these communities looks um, really unique. So that said, um, there's, there's a lot happening in, in the housing arena. And um, I think there, I, might, I might have a statistic. Oh yeah, and then the Vermont Housing Finance Agency as well has estimated that um, to bring down the, uh, the cost of housing and to really try to meet the need of housing right now, uh, we're going to need about 10,000 units over the next five years. Uh, units of all shapes and sizes from single uh, one bedroom studios, two bedrooms, all the way to single family homes, duplexes. Um, so there is definitely a, a, a lot of, of need for, for housing but also there's a, a really big opportunity. There's still lots of money from um, the infrastructure funds that will be coming down the pike in the next couple of years to help us build out water and sewer, broadband infrastructure, those types of systems. So there's a lot of opportunity when it comes to housing, but there's also a, a, a lot of challenges too. So, so those are some of the, the discussions that are playing out at the State House. And that's, um, I don't know if I went over or not. Oh, great. Wonderful. Anyway, but yeah, no, thank you very much. I mean, I, I'm more than happy to answer any questions, and, and thank you very much for, for having me. I hope I was able to hit on some of the bigger policy topics at the State House. But as we all know, I mean, there's always a ton going on. Um, and feel free to, to reach out. My email is right on the, the screen. You know, I always say we're, we're best when we can hear from as many people as we can. Um, to hear the stories of Vermonters, because ultimately what, what uh, lawmakers do at the State House matters, but it's about how the policies that they pass 
affects the lives of each and every one of you. So I think that's always really important to keep in mind. And whenever we can tell the stories of, of folks and how public policy affects them, I think is always um, really critical. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So, so can you hear me? Yes. So Zoomers, we, we, we need some questions from you. Okay, we're looking for quite a few. Okay, all right. Most of you you probably heard a couple of us laughing up here at the idea of the governor collaborating with the legislature to avoid vetoes, which has not been characteristic of in, in the past. Have you noticed in view of the veto proof, well, quote unquote, veto proof majorities this year, have you noticed any change in the attitude of the administration? That's a great question. Yeah, thank you for asking. I think there has been a, a little bit of a change uh, as opposed to last year, last legislative session with Speaker Krowinski and Becca Ballant uh, in charge. They always said that the governor was a little bit late to the negotiating table, that you know he didn't always show up, uh, or sometimes he came in at the last moment, they said, with you know certain um, requests or you know when it was too late they alleged at times you know when it was too late to uh, you know work or, or change pieces of legislation I think at this point in the session we really haven't heard a lot from the governor in terms of weighing in on public policy certainly the other day we heard him really come out swinging against the clean heat standard or the affordable heat act I should say um, so he is, is pushing back on that but in terms of outreach uh, to you know the House and Senate, he says that he has meetings with them biweekly. Um, but I'm not entirely sure what those uh, those meetings and what those relationships have looked like to date. But also, there there haven't been that many pieces of legislation that have made it to his desk yet, too. On the clean heat, uh, on the clean heat standard. Uh, that it envisioned a massive change to heat in Vermont here with our 20 degree low zero heating days sometimes. Uh, you would need a redundancy of electric power. Has any in the state out there, anybody been considering this? Any plan to uh, uh, increase uh, our electric grid redundancy? That's a great point and a great question. And that has been floated. I know there has been, I don't know of any specific piece of legislation where they've, they're looking at you know, increasing the resiliency of our grid. I know that, as I mentioned, there's a lot of money coming from federal infrastructure funds that they've been you know, talking about investing it and, and building it up. Um, but I think you're, you're right. I mean, there are challenges with a cold air heat pump and that cold snap we had a few weeks ago when it was negative uh, 15. Um, you know, there's, there's questions about do we need more redundancy, you know, having a, a, a you know, propane heater or, or otherwise. Um, but I guess in terms of you know how some of these investments will be built out on the ground, um, I think we'll we'll still have to see. I hope that answers your question. We have a couple of Zoom questions. I do have a couple of Zoom questions. Unless you've already covered it in your presentation, what are the provisions of a bill recently introduced to provide subsidies to preschools and daycare operations to help these businesses which are on tight margins? That's a great question. I unfortunately don't have the bill in front of me. I don't know if I'd want to speak to each one of the individual points. I mean, I can say broadly that that there is a that sweeping child care bill um, that's moving through, and they are looking to increase subsidies for both families and for providers as well um, to to really right the, the the financial ship, so to speak, and to make it sustainable. But I'm sorry, I don't have those numbers in, in front of me, so I don't know if I can speak directly to it. Question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, will the Affordable Heat Act apply to existing houses as well as new construction, 
or just the new construction? Uh, both. If it applies to construction, will there be subsidies for upfront costs to cover heat pump? Yes. Okay. So there, there are subsidies available for both new construction and existing structures as well to help people transition. Um, Commissioner of Public Service, um, yeah, Department of Public Service Commissioner June Tierney said that there is, uh, you know, grants available, and there also is uh, money to help people with their electric bills as well. To, when we make this transition, there also is help. Um, I don't know if we, it's unclear whether that will be enough or what the need will be there. Um, there's still, as I said, a lot of unknowns with this bill, and lawmakers are looking to spend the next two years to study some of those questions. But uh, in short, yes, there, there are immense subsidies for, um, you know, uh, for, for uh, cold air heat pumps and water boilers and that type of thing. I have two questions. Number one, about 10 days ago, Governor Scott came forward to say we have surplus money. And he would like to see that not all spent, right? Because he wants to match some of these incoming federal outlets so that Vermont can get that money. That's number one. And what's the reaction at this point of the legislature? Number two, you please define for me as best you can, or is it, or as it is understood now, what is affordable housing, or is it a shifting fair? <laughs> <laughs> Two fantastic questions. I think I'll take the the second one first. And I don't know have I don't have a textbook definition, um, but the 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 definition that is most li widely referred to is it's up to thirty. If affordable housing is a place that you're living where you're paying no more than 30% of your income. So if you're making uh, $1,000 a week, well, you wouldn't be paying rent weekly. I'm not, I'm not very good at math, but it's up to 30% essentially of, of um, you know, your, yeah, exactly. S that said though, you know, there is a lot of confusion about what does it mean to have affordable housing? What does affordable mean? in each community because affordable means something different to, to everybody, right? So, um, but that's, that's kind of by and large the kind of ballpark definition. And I guess to your, your first question about the federal match money, um, you're right, there is uh, an immense amount of money coming from the Infrastructure Act um, for roads and bridges, broadband, water, sewer, et cetera, but a lot of these projects require a state match as well. So the federal government might provide 75% of the, a bridge funding or funding for a bridge project or a road, but we need to spend 25% to match that. Um, the governor would like to see, I think it's 150 million in this current budget set aside for that. Um, so we'll be able to meet some of those projects coming down the pike. Leadership in the House and Senate, Jill Krowinski and um, Phil Baruth, they haven't weighed in on that specific um, you know, on the governor's ask as of yet. Um, but there are also some in the legislature, not, not just Democrats, but there's also others that, you know, say we have some really pressing needs right now, like childcare, like housing. Um, and so some of those surpluses might be better spent elsewhere. So again, it's, it's this philosophical discussion of, you know, how do we best use the resources that we have? One more. Suppose that, supposing we do need 10,000 more units of housing, I wonder how many housing units there are in our state right now. What percent of increase would the 10,000 units be for our existing number? And if our population has remained stable for so long, who would these new units be targeted? So I guess the, the last question, so there is, right now in our housing market, there is a lack of what we're calling what, what some housing developers call m the missing middle. Think of your, your single family home, two or three bedrooms, places where you, know, you and your partner can move and start a family and not live in an apartment. There is an acute lack of that housing and because of that, that's like, it's a ceiling that some renters and some people are, are hitting and they can't move on to that next stage in life. They can't have that, that white picket fence or that, that yard, can't have a house. So there's a, an immense amount of housing that's needed here in Vermont um, that you know, 
people that already live here will use it. Plus, uh, you know, even at um, you know the lowest income spectrum as well, individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, there's at least in central Vermont alone. I know in the Barry Montpelier area, there's. Uh, 300 people that are, are unhoused. And so there is a, an immense need for, for housing up and down the income spectrum. But also we want to, you know, help bring new people to the state, but also, um, you know, do it, do it in a responsible, equitable way. I have a brief comment uh, talking about stuff, not extrapolating. Um, it seems he um, he says he meets with them twice a week, but I think he sends his aides. And it, uh, not a, uh, yeah. Okay, is that better? Perfect. Uh, I think he sends his aides, and they must not tell him anything because every time he gets asked about a bill, he says, "I haven't seen the bill yet." <laughs> You'd think someone who looked at the bill and his administration had talked about it with him, but apparently he wants to wait till it's right on his desk and then it gets to be too late, right? They have to go back and do something. So, but my question is, um, in regards to uh, mental health care, the governor likes to say that he's, you know, this is a big priority of his, but every year he puts nothing in uh, his budget for a raise, for people who take care of people with mental illness and intellectual disabilities. And so he, he's put in some money for a, a program here and a program there, but nothing for the people who they have uh, so much turnover mm. and vacancy rates at Howard Center and uh, the other designated agencies. It's incredible. It would blow your mind to, to know what those rates are. And the only way they you know, if he wants, if our health care is so important, people are getting out of health care <laughs> because they're not getting paid enough. And um, I think uh, the, the agencies every year have to ask for their own, and they had several years where they got no raises at all in the Medicaid rate. And so I, I think that was a, a big place. He never puts that in the budget, so the legislature fights for it, mm. which is we're very fortunate that they do. And... Um, Briefly, too, about the housing, uh, <laughs> the city of South Burlington got rid of 44 acres, had to get rid of 44 acres of affordable housing in the Chamberlain District when the F-35s came. And uh, they're supposed to put that back into housing when this, supposedly the F-35s were supposed to leave at some point, but <laughs> I, I, I know. When. So I, I just, uh, you know, and, and as a neighbor there, I, we had to fight to keep them from expanding. They wanted to put something else there, and they're trying to get the city council and the planning board to give them permission uh, to put uh, some of their stuff, a warehouse or something, in these uh, places where housing is. And if we could replace that housing, South Burlington and Chamber County would be so much uh, better. So I, I don't know if. Uh, you know, any of that has been, been talked about in the legislature or not, I don't think so. No, I, I haven't heard, um, I mean, I have heard uh, in South Burlington with this ongoing discussion about housing and where to build it and smart growth development. Um, you know, there, there has been some conversation in South Burlington dealing with like the, the land trust. I know there's swaths of land that they would like protected, but it's also zoned for housing. Um, or could could be developed for housing, I say, because there's water and sewer there. Um, but in terms of the F-35, um, you know, I don't know if I've actually heard that word uttered once at the state house this year. Yeah. If I'm uh, if I'm being I honest. Think it's something that we're discussing here in the Chamberlain District. I'll look into that. It's interesting. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's that's a good story. One more question. Yes. So, 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. As of right now, I do not believe there's any big broad investments in broadband right now. The CUDs, the communication union districts, are working through some of the money right now. Um, Vermont is in a really good spot in terms of the broadband picture because before there were supply chain shortages and inflation and whatnot, um, the CUDs went out and bought a lot of the, the raw um, fiber, uh, the big spools of fiber. But the big challenge that we're seeing right now is having the qualified staff to string that fiber and to install it and to build that, that last mile, so to speak. Um, but even then, though, um, I, f I don't know the exact percentage, but there is still, even with all of the, the immense federal money that we've had for broadband, all of the money that we spent last year and the year before, um, there is still quite a bit, uh, quite, quite a, a ways to go in terms of making sure every Vermonter is, is hooked up. Thank you so much. This has been great, Calvin. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you.